Uh, my name is Martin Fergie, um, and Mihai invited me down here today to give a bit of talk and we're going to do a linear, linear models for regressions. So, um, what I thought with this is I came a couple of weeks ago to uh, Microsoft talk that they did, and they were very much focused on his API, he just uses API, and I thought it was the opposite approach. I really dig deep into one subject that we could uh, learn quite thoroughly, hopefully with a small amount of time, give you a good feel for how it works. Um, there's a really key concept for lots of machine learning ideas. It's one of those sort of underpinning ideas we need to get. So, uh, okay, so sort of the outline for talks. First, I'm just going to say a little bit about me and who I am, um, and then we'll tell you through just what regression is as a concept, uh, what a linear model is, regression, how we can extend linear models to non-linear data, what that is, um, and then how we go about choosing model parameters using cross-validation. Um, I'm just to get a feel, how many in the room are familiar with machine learning concepts in general, uh, linear regression, cross-validation, things like that? It's about half, so that's good. That's good. So, so I'm not assuming any lump knowledge. Um, there's a few equations, but there's nothing that complicated. There's nothing that you don't do at school, uh, so it should be all right. So I studied here at Manchester University. I did the BSc and I did the PhD. My PhD was, um, well, I spent four years trying to get the green lines to show up in the right place on videos of people doing dancing and sign language. So marvelous human motion tracking. So given just an image of somebody in a camera feed, so this was a sequence of somebody dancing, you've got a lot of sign language videos as well, you try and learn a mapping from the image space onto the 3D articulated pose of the person, so you can track their joints over time. So this was actually all using regression, essentially. Um, what was quite a bit more sophisticated than what we'll talk about today, but it's all the same principle. So now I uh, work with Digital Bridge, so we are a small company, a startup based just across the road in Manchester Science Park. And our kind of area of interest is sort of building consumer applications for interior decoration with a very heavy emphasis on doing computer vision to solve these kind of problems. So our main applications, you can take a picture of your room, you work out where the walls and the floors are, the orientation of the walls, so you can start decorating. And um, I've got a couple of videos just to show you quickly. Uh, to start with. So, yeah, here's a quick picture of us of the uh, iPad app. So, so, take a picture of the roof, and then straight away you can start to. That's a cool thing. <laughs> so, yeah, you just click on the wall, and we've automatically worked out where the walls are, how it's orientated with respect to the camera. So, you can start to experiment with virtual furnishings. Um, also, just 3D furniture as well. do the same for 3D furniture. So once you've got the picture and you've understood the geometry of your room, you can put 3D furniture in and start experimenting, you know, will that fit there, how will that look there? Um, so another project we've been looking at as well, as I said, Marius who's been doing a work placement with us, he's been looking at um, building a, an augmented reality application where you use a lead motion to control the hand to sort of track your hand movements and then you can interact with Furniture in virtual reality, move it around just by picking it up, throwing it around the room. It's quite good fun. Um, there's somebody else there as well, just embarrassing. Um, okay, so you may, some of you may have met us because we've come to the department on a couple of occasions to uh, sort of group work by some students and so forth. Um, yeah, that's that. If you want to have a go at our application, uh, we've set up a trial site called peachypad.co um, and you can sign up to that and you can try decorating your lunch. Um, cool. So about the talk today. Um, what I'm aiming for is a very bare bones, simple implementation of linear regression where we're not using any library, so to speak of. So there's nothing, no code that's sort of hidden away if you have to try understand things you interpret. It's all based using Python and NumPy. Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Python, use it before, and NumPy. 
specifically. Oh, good. That's a nice bunch. So NumPy is really just a library for dealing with multi-dimensional arrays. So for numerical data, you can define uh, you know, like a 2D array of numbers, which represents an image, and it allows you to do very fast operations on those within Python. It's got a very nice interface. Um, well, the code's been written so that it's easy to understand, as opposed to being necessarily the best way of implementing these solutions. Uh, and that's just to make it much easier for you to look at it, understand how it works, and then experiment yourself. Yeah, no libraries. It's all about understanding. The code is available at that GitHub um, link for you to have a go with. It's pretty straightforward to run. There's also a link on the event page. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, about regression. So, generally, the problem of regression in machine learning is trying to map from one continuous variable space to another continuous variable space. So, in this, this is a really simple graph of some data I've made up. I was hoping to find a nice data set that would work for this talk, but I ran out of time. Um, basically, what we're trying to do is given an input x, but this is something we measure about the world, we want to infer an output y, which is a quantity that might tell us something. So, I think the analogy I'm going to use for the talk is let's say what we're interested in doing is predicting the price of a house based on its square footage. So one might assume that there's a linear correlation between the size of the house and the amount it's going to cost. And this is a huge simplification, but that's with good reason. So let's pretend our graph here shows that. So what we can see is firstly, it's largely linear. You, know, you can see there's a kind of an upwards trend that tails off at the top. So that might make sense that once you get to really, really big houses, it doesn't matter anymore what the size, they're just really, really expensive. But also, because we're being so simple, there's loads of uncertainty and ambiguity in our relationship. And you can see that by the, the sort of the vertical spread, which is the, the noise in the data. So part of it is about finding a model that could uh, model both that sort of linear relationship as well as being robust to these forms of ambiguity. Um, and we tend to look at this as a functional mapping, really. And this really helps when you're thinking about these problems. Is we want to estimate a function by giving our input x on the left, our x transforms into the space of y with, um, sorry, with, an, with an uncertainty term that we've sort of encapsulated. Epsilon. Throughout this talk, we're not really going to say anything about uncertainty, but if you uh, want to study further, there's a whole world involved in how you model uncertainty, which you as well. Um, is everybody happy with regression as a concept? You all understand that? Cool. Um, so, linear regression is basically fitting a straight line. So, what we're trying to do is find the straight line that matches all our points. As as best we can. Um, really, this is using you know your old y equals mx plus c line equation from school. We're trying to find m and c that best meets our data, and but we're trying to do that in a way as well that we might do be dealing with higher dimensional data. Than that. So our input features may be they may contain you know, ten dimensions, they may contain thousands, hundreds of thousands of input dimensions. We want to find a linear mapping from our input data, which is our square footage of the house, down to our output data, which is the, the price of it. And so we can calculate that in this equation, uh, fx equals w transpose times by x plus b. So here w is the sort of the, the line coefficient, so that's your n, that's how steep the slope is on the line, so that's how quickly your output responds to one of your inputs. And bias is just uh, the intercept of where the line will cross through to zero. Um, and yeah, as I say, so this, this can happen for arbitrarily sized input dimensions. So, how do we go about solving this problem? This is a. Oh yeah, we know this already, sorry. So, yeah, we're trying to find our vector of coefficients, which is the slope of the line, the intercept. What we actually do in order to make the notation a bit simpler is by appending a column of ones onto our 
x inputs, we can actually get rid of the intercept term altogether. So we're just putting a constant column of ones on the end of our uh, square footages for the houses. And that allows us to drop the bias term out of the equation. So we'll forget about that for now because it's all handled in the model. And you'll see this again in the code and hopefully make a bit more sense there. Cool. So, what we're essentially aiming to do then is find the line that minimizes our kind of prediction error. So, this is a, a 2D drawing that I've uh, that a book that I'll then show to tell you about at the end. And what we're trying to do is find the the plane or the line that minimizes the distance between the line itself and each of the points in our data that we're interested in modeling. And you can call this is encapsulated by what we call the residual sum of squares, which is this equation at the top there. And we're basically taking the yi is our actual data point from our uh, data set that we're working with, and f of x is our prediction about that data. So we're just taking the square differences between our prediction and the actual value. We want to find the set of coefficients, so as in the y equals m which we'll see, we'll be able to see, that minimize that quantity there. Um, and so what we can do now is we can substitute in our, rather than dealing with abstract terms in f of x, we can now substitute in our linear equation. So we've got y equals xt times w, I'll swap the x and w around, but that's okay. Um, and we can then expand that into, um, I've also missed the square of the top equation, I do apologise. The bottom equation, we can expand that into a quadratic equation. So this is just like the ones you deal with in college and stuff. Uh, all we need to do is find the roots of that quadratic equation. Uh, <coughs> quick note here as well, so what we're doing now is we're dealing rather than just with vectors, we're also dealing with matrices. So the, the big capital X is now a matrix which contains all of our input data arranged row by row. So just like an Excel table, we might have uh, house price 1, house price 2, house price 3, house price 4, and you have 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, like that for our bias term. So, again, so to solve this quadratic equation, uh, as I'm sure you remember, quadratic equations are a bit like that. <laughs> and we want to find the smallest point in that equation, because that's the one bit with the lowest error. So we want to find the bottom of that function, and that bottom of the function is the bit that's flat. That everybody following that? So all we need to do is differentiate the function so that we can get its gradient, set that uh, difference equation to zero and then solve it for our coefficients. So the top line is the sort of the, uh, the y, the, the second line there, just differentiated. So that's just the, kind of the first uh, derivative of our residual sum of squares. And then we set that equal to zero, rearrange it to give us a, an equation in terms of w, our coefficients. Um, if you, if you need to just, it might be help if you're interested, in, it's just afterwards, try that out on paper just to check that you can do the steps. It's really straightforward. Um, it just looks a bit intimidating. So, let's look at how the, uh, the code for this goes. Um, so first, what I've done is, um, if you look at the actual Python code, that can just give you a talk to at the moment as well. I've basically created a really simple class for linear regression. It's maybe only 25 lines long or something. Now I'll start with the prediction part. This is the simplest bit in the way. So this is where we want to say, um, right, if we're modeling our f of x there, so we take our coefficients, multiply our data by the coefficients, and that gives us our prediction. So the first thing we're doing, our function basically takes a uh, reference to itself. I can get that, you know that, and a single variable x, which is our the data we want to predict for arranged row by row in the matrix. Um, we stick our column of ones on it for the first step, and we convert that into a numpy matrix, but that's just to make the code easy to read. We read our coefficient from our class, and then we do simply y equals x times w. 
that gives us the y values, you can turn them the y values. Nice and straightforward. Um, now the, uh, the fitting bit, so here we refer to learning our parameters that represent the data based on the data given. So again, we type a set of ones on the end, um, you can say matrix grid. And then this is where this is where the key equation comes in. So our uh, so our weight equals the x to the x inverse multiplied by x to the y. This is all going to catch up here. So this np dot linear dot inverse that computes the inverse of uh, what np did. It. This is our x x transpose times x. Take the inverse of that, and then we do that inverse to times x transpose times y. That gives us our coefficients. We then store that co those coefficients in the class. So again. Okay. Very straightforward, there's nothing too complicated going on there. Uh, so, how do we actually then use this model? So, what we've done, so the data I've shown you already is actually just generated from a sign function with some noise thrown in. So, just to give a, a data, some data that's got some ambiguity to it, it's also not completely linear, so it's not completely straight line, so we don't get the strength to get the perfect answers. So, the first part of what we're doing is we generate some data to work with. I've set some sensible parameters to give me a nice little line. Uh, you'll see those in the code. We then break that data up into training, validation, and test sets. How many of you are familiar with that as a concept? A few. Okay, so the idea of a training set, that's the data that you use to train your model parameters. Um, the validation set you use to Find, find the parameters and can't learn directly from the data through cross-validation, which we'll come to later on. And your test data, that's what you do your final evaluation with. That's the bit of data you hold out to check that your model actually works. Um, yeah, so once we've broken our data into its partitions, we create an instance of our linear, linear regression class, we fit it to our data, so we pass it the X training data and the Y training data, and then we predict the outputs and then we can evaluate how well that works. So, uh, I'll show you the evaluation in a So yeah, so what we get is this red line, passing through all the points, hopefully, you see it's slightly perfect, but that's okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's now the line represented by those coefficients that we've learned. And so, the next step is, so how do we evaluate that? Um, we evaluate that in the same and in terms like we used the residual, residual sum of squares earlier on, we're just going to uh, compute what we call the mean squared error. So that's saying, on average, what's the average squared distance between our prediction and the actual data point? And that's just, a, just this kind of the standard way of uh, analyzing how well a regression model works. And then the mean squared error for this data is 0.99. So, how can we do better than this? Because obviously our data here is not actually perfectly linear. It's not, it can't be represented by a straight line. We I mean, can never do perfectly because there's quite a lot of noise in the underlying data. But it'd be nice if we could fit a curvy line to the data to get a much better model of the actual process that's going on. Now, very fortunately, one of the really interesting problems about linear models and how they then expand to all sorts of other machine learning techniques is uh, the uses of the basis functions or kernels, where we can take our data, represent it in another sort of feature space, and that allows us to then do linear inference on that data and fit nonlinear functions. This is the whole principle about how, say, uh, you know, like deep neural networks work and things like that. Really, they're just very fancy feature transformations. So this curvy line gets a significantly lower error if it's not one six nine. So let's learn how to do that. Um, so this is known as the kernel trick. Um, basically what we're doing here is instead of passing our input data straight to the coefficients, we first wrap it in a function which projects it into another, well it doesn't necessarily project it, but it transforms it into another 
feature space. This is typically a higher dimensional feature space. And that basically takes data that would be used a nonlinear function k to transform your data into another representation. And then you can learn to do your linear prediction on top of that nonlinear data. And that then allows you to do these uh, fairly lines. So this is the, the, kind of the, the most common kernel to use in these circumstances are called radial basis functions. Um, and this is really, it's really like the kind of the Gaussian uh, likelihood function. So what it does is it encodes the similarity between two different inputs. So the, the function here, uh, the RK function, takes two possible values of x, it computes the distance, and then squashes that through a, uh, an exponent function such that uh, when two points are exactly the same, it gives us a 1. And as they become further and further apart in space, the number drops down towards 0. So this square on the right is the visualization of a, a kind of a radial basis function kernel for the uh, data that we generated for these experiments. So the kind of the indexing works so you've got all your data points going across the bottom, going down, and all your data points going across the right as well. And each pixel is the pairwise distance between the two data points. So the top left is data point zero, uh, pushed through this RBF function with data point one. The bottom, sorry, data point zero, data point zero. Down on the bottom right will be the very last two data points. So it's just like a table comparing each point by each point. Does everybody understand that? I feel like I'm just uh, explaining that in a terrible fashion. So I think it's funny to me. <laughs> um, basically what we're doing is instead of representing our points as a, as a single data point like the, um, the square pitch of the house, we're actually representing it as its distance to all the other points in the trending set. So saying this point is really similar to that point, that point, that point, it's far, very far away from all these points over here. And that set of distances becomes our feature for each point in our data. And then we simply uh, learn the mapping from that representation to our uh, target variable, in this case the house price, using uh, this, this feature representation instead. Now, fortunately, the actual linear regression part of this stays exactly the same. We don't need to change the model that we used earlier on to do straight lines. All we do by kind of pre-processing our input data like this, we can now model curvy lines. So, just as before, we create a data at the top, we create our linear regression model, and then this time, now what we're doing is we've got our kernel function here, and this is the really key bit. So we're saying, okay, we're going to create a kernel function that uses our original training data, and then encodes any new data it's given as a set of distances from each point in the training data. So now our feature space, rather than being two-dimensional, which was the square footage plus the ones, is going to be uh, n-dimensional, where n is the number of training samples that we had in our original data. And so, I don't know how many of you are familiar with closures, binding, partial binding function parameters, code for a bit complicated otherwise. So, what we're doing is we're creating this kernel function with kernel underscore fn, which you give it some data and it will give you the distances relative to the rest of the data. And then we can just pass that, instead of now passing x into our bit function, we pass in k, which is just that kernel data, which is the the fancy red and blue thing. And we predict in the same way. Yep, go ahead. What else do you think that's not a good idea? What do I think? Oh, okay. I'll come to that in a moment if you don't mind. So that's that's just um, the actual <coughs> generating of sign data. Um, I'll show you that bit of code a little later on. That's just to give us the, the ambiguity of the data. You know, so it's got some vertical spread, it's not just a perfect sign code. Um, yeah. Uh, oh yeah, okay, I'll spot it. I should talk to you about that in a moment. That's regularization, which I'm going to come to shortly. Um, so yeah, hold that thought. Yeah, so the key thing, what we do is we change the representation of input data, allows us to now model nonlinear curvy lines. 
Um, so here's a more sort of extreme example where we take the same model, and this is the same sine wave data, only of extended it over a larger range. The linear model obviously can't handle this, it just draws a straight line from the points. Whereas using the, the radial basis functions as a kernel, before we give it to the new model, we can now get a model that predicts the curvy line. Um, so, into your question, regularization. So, one of the problems with using nonlinear models is you need to, there's, there's many different solutions that could fit a particular sample of data. So, this red line could make its way broadly through the points like that, but alternatively, it could also try and get it to pass exactly through every point in your training data, in which case, you're no longer modeling the process that generates the training data, you're modeling the training data itself. And so when you try and predict against unseen data, say like your test set, you'll get lower results. So what we can do with this is we can uh, use the term for regularization, or it's other known as, otherwise known as shrinkage, depending on which kind of circle it's involving. Uh, and we use this basically to constrain the coefficients of the model keep it sufficiently simple in its representation. So what we're doing here is, so if we look at this equation here, earlier on we were trying to find the sets of coefficients w that minimize the residual sum of squares. We're doing the exact same again, except now we're adding a penalty term, which basically uh, takes the overall size of the coefficients themselves. So if it has a learns bigger coefficients, so W contains numbers in the thousands, it will give that model a lower score than it will a model where all the W values are like 0.3 and 0.4. And the, yeah? What would you do That's, that's a, sorry, L2 normal. So that's basically saying uh, what's the distance between the two points. It's basically saying what the length of the vector W is. So it's a, you know, like a vector norm. It's just a vector. It's a vector. Yes. Why do you use So that's a good question. And the answer for why we use this today is because the maths is much simpler. So you can also use now one norm, which uh, basically measures all the coefficients of the And that actually gives better performance in certain scenarios, but it doesn't allow for the easier for the it's not as easy to solve the equation you can't do it in post form. So that, that's another thing that you can look into. If you look at the book I reference at the end, I'll tell you all about that. Go ahead. But is addition the best way to combine them, or can they also be multiplied? So, multiplying would be making sense, I don't think. Yeah. I don't know why it makes sense, per se. But, Really what you're trying to do is just add in an extra term to keep those weights down. I think if you were to multiply, I don't know what would happen if you did that. Maybe you can check out the code and try it. That's no. um, yeah, but uh, this, this is just kind of stuff. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, so the key thing is, back to your question, alpha allows us to control the degree to which we penalize our solutions based on the size of the coefficient. So making alpha smaller, means that that penalty term is smaller and it allows the weight coefficients to grow, uh, which means more bendy lines. So here's three plots and we're varying alpha from, I think it's 10 to 0 0.0, 0 0.1 to 0.0, 0 0.0, So you can see as you do this, the, the fit that you get changes. It starts off with a, a flat, a largely straight line. Uh, it gets curvier and curvier as you increase the lab because you're allowing your model to fit the data more closely as you do that. So, the next obvious question is how do you get the head? What if your alpha is too small? It kind of collapses eventually. So what you'd expect, and I was hoping to have a plot like this, but I couldn't get it to work properly, is potentially you get to the point where your red line fits through every point in your training data. So you have this crazy line that squiggles up and down like that. Um, I was trying to produce it, but it wasn't playing for the so I had to give up that far. 
But yeah, that, that would be the extreme case. I think I hit the point where it just became numerically so unstable. So the output got too small, the computer couldn't really do it. Um, yeah. So, right, so how do we choose out them? So, this is where we can use a uh, technique called cross validation. Um, this is where it becomes key about how we split our training data. So, we're basically breaking so the three sets I said earlier on. So, the training part is the data we're going to use to learn coefficients. The validation part is what we're going to use to test how well different versions of alpha, different values for alpha do. And then the test part is where we get our overall performance, test performance at the end. So if you do one of these machine learning challenges uh, like Kaggle or it's lots of big challenges where you can submit your results, you'll be given training and validation data, but they'll keep the test data secret. So you submit your results and them, they tell you how well you did. Um, and that's how you can have sort of a fair competition. Because if you know what the test is, so, what we've done here, just to show, is I've fitted this line from before with loads of different uh, values of alpha, so just increasing by powers of 10. And then we found the one which is best, which is at 10 to the minus 3. Uh, and we do that by evaluating the mean squared error, which we did before. But that gives us the solution. So, that's the, uh, the lines that we picked. This is the line that we did best. Was the gave us the best representation of the data. Yes? Is means the best measuring error on the non-linear model? I mean, that's No, it's not, because you're still, you're basically saying, what's the distance between my predicted value and the ground truth value, the actual value? The model is changing in non-linear The output changes on non-linear But that's not necessarily a problem, because you're only ever look like looking at the point estimate. So if you want to say, well, I want to predict how uh, I want to predict how much a, uh, a house which had a hundred square foot of space in it would cost, and you got an answer of uh, hundred thousand pounds. The real answer was hundred ten. All you want, all you care about is the difference between your two predictions. You don't really care how you got there. Uh, do you see what I mean? There are more sophisticated and other measures for measuring. Uh, accuracy in these things. For example, one of the things that you may want to do, we don't talk about here, is taking into account the uncertainty in your predictions. So obviously, our data is not the ambiguous here. It might be nice to know not just what the, the mean prediction is, I suppose it's a slightly like school of thought, but it's like a slightly more fancy school of thought. We don't want to just know what the mean prediction is, but we want to know what's our uncertainty or our variance over that prediction. So, what range do we expect our prediction to lie? And there's loads of techniques that address those things. And that in those sorts of cases, you may want to, for example, measure the log likelihood of your um, test data, how low the test data is predicted, given the distribution you're assuming to have. So, again, there's, yeah, there's a whole world to go, go into there. Um, I'm supposed to have a page with the code for cross validation set, but I'm just going to show you the. Uh, so I'll just give you a quick show of the cross validation script itself. see the code for this, obviously you get this all on the GitHub repository afterwards. Very similar to before, that's what we had to see. Anyone see that? Okay. So we generate our data at the top, because that's the sort of top few lines up here. And then we define the set of parameters that we want to explore. So we're going to try, in this case we're creating a log space, so say 10 to the power of 1, all the way down to 10 to the power of 1. Five, you know, seven times, so it pulls up nice values. And we then basically loop over each parameter and we create a model for that version, that value of alpha. We 
fit that model to our data. And this fit model just encapsulates the stuff we saw earlier on, comparing the training data, computing the evaluation, how well it performs. And then we keep track of all those errors for each value of alpha. Then we pick the version of alpha that is best. So we research to find the index of what the lowest score, use that to track the alpha value. And then there's this bit of code there which just draws some graphs. And then it, then it refits another model with that value of alpha and predicts the output. So that's how I got the graphs that you just saw in the slides. Um, if you want to, uh, does everybody understand that? I should be happy with that. It will make sense. Um, so this is kind of intended as a jumping off board, really, because it, what I've hoped to do is to give the sort of an intuition to the most basic form of the model. Um, if you're interested in learning more, there is Elements of Statistical Learning, which is uh, freely available online. There's another really good book called um, uh, Pattern Recognition by Chris Bishop, which takes a more Bayesian stance on things. Uh, all the concepts are kind of the same, but you'll see different groups of people have different names for everything, which can be a bit confusing. Uh, the, this Elements of Statistical Learning covers the theory really well. It's, very, it's worth a while to read, but it's quite hard going at times. Uh, if you want a more sort of basic overview of what kind of approaches and techniques can take this idea further, have a look at the Scikit-Learn website, because their user guide is probably the best concise coverage I've seen of all these concepts. And it will also show you how these apply to classification as well. Are you all familiar with classification? Um, yeah. Most classification models are based on the same principles as this, except instead of uh, just using W times X is your output, you squash it through a sigmoid function, which means the output goes from 0 and 1. That's a linear model of classification. That's the basic tool used in all sorts of uh, other techniques, such as, uh, like I said, like neural networks, are all based on assembling lots of linear classifiers in the hierarchy and pushing data through. Um, there's also more advanced regression techniques that's worth looking into. These models. The ones I've shown here, you wouldn't really use them in practice because they quickly fall over. They have quite a few sort of uh, problems with them. But there's other things like Gaussian processes, which are really good for modeling uncertainty, like small sparse state sets, or random forests, I think you've heard of them. Very good for handling large regression problems, modeling yeah, multimodal problems as well. Um, yeah, are there any more questions? How do you choose a kernel? How do you know you're choosing a good kernel? Okay, yeah, so that's the same. That's the very good question. So obviously there's some choice coming to this kernel. Um, and there's even a secret little parameter that I have to show. So uh, the code for the kernel is down here. So we also have, like, for example, within the choice of once we pick our RPM kernel, we also have a gamma parameter which Show you the equation that controls the spread of the kernel. Um, both the choice of kernel and its parameters need to be chosen. You choose those using cross validation again. So you would try out different kernels. Um, other options might be, say, a polynomial kernel, whereas instead of just having your input value x, you take x, x squared, x third, x fourth, and that allows you then to model quadratic functions just by transforming your feature data into this polynomial space. So what you do is you try out all the different kernels, evaluate them on the validation set, use that to choose the one that works best for your data. Um, same with the gamma, once you pick, you try out your RBF kernel, with loads of different values of gamma, see the one which works best for you. There are more advanced models, so for example, Gaussian processes, that allows you to learn the kernel parameters from your data, um, which is very powerful, but unfortunately very slow. Any other questions? Okay, um, how, how do you kind of choose the feature space you want to have? Like, sure, if you have a kernel like this, yeah. you just want to do your parameters, uh, but you can have a different type, like, how do you choose the type of kernel? So you do that, you essentially, under this, you essentially do it through the same process. You identify the kernel for our piece of promise, might like, say RBF. Oh, yeah, yeah. There's also other things like 
to build them on those like basis functions from like wavelets and things like that. There's loads of different possibilities, and you just have to try them out on your validation data, basically. Yes? Uh, how long do these programs take years so, yeah, so that's a good question. So in this case, obviously, a linear model wouldn't manage this at all. It would just draw a straight line to where it felt best. Um, and you would expect a, the, when we use the RBF kernel, that's going to smooth it out a bit, because you're putting some smoothness constraints on the lines. A very common solution to data like that is to actually use piecewise models. So instead of learning one linear model, you learn a number of linear models that each cover certain portions of the data set. Um, so a, a, a model for these the Bayesian functions of experts is a very common type. And actually, that allows you to model non-linear functions using multiple linear functions, each a partition in the input space. So that, that's how, when you have problems like that, that's how you would model that. Your questions? Do you feel like you understand it? Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, if there's no more questions, then thank you very much. If anybody tries to explain the code and has any problems or issues or questions, you can get in contact with me uh, to get that guess. Just to make sure that I should try and respond. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>